this video, we're finally taking a look at the voice controlled TV remote. Well, at least that's what I'm calling it. Uh, we're going to go through exactly how to set up the hardware here, what I've got going on, and then we're going to jump over to the code and uh, try to deconstruct what's going on there. This is going to be kind of a long video, so uh, if you really want to build one of these things, stay tuned. So what we got here, though, uh, just as a refresher, is we've got a standalone Arduino. We've got an infrared receiver here, which is used to program the Arduino with a, any button off of a TV remote. So you point your remote at the receiver and you push a button. The Arduino, while it's listening, takes that code and stores it into an external EEPROM. Uh, we have a 24LC256 back here operating on a, an I squared C uh, communication interface. Then what it can do is then output that code using infrared LEDs and mimic your TV remote. Because you know your TV remote just has infrared LEDs in here. So we put up we put some infrared LEDs here on uh, on the breadboard so we can control TVs using an Arduino. So it's pretty cool. Then just to make it a little bit more cool I decided to put an easy VR voice recognition module um, on here as well. And this uses, uh, I think I'm communicating with this using a software library. So software serial library, sorry. And uh, so that turns it into a voice recognition TV remote. So it's listening for me to say like five or whatever, and then it outputs whatever button five code is to the TV. We also have a uh, a rotary encoder up here, so I've got a video on that already, and I just dumped that code and that hardware right into this circuit here, and then of course an LCD. So nothing special there. So let's just jump right into uh, how this works. But before I do that, I just want to give you a little bit of background on this this project. So one day after a, a crappy day at work and it was uh, raining out, I came home and I might have drank in. I don't know, 14 beers while I did this and coded this uh, circuit up. So the code is extremely rough. It's not commented it out at all. It, in fact, a lot of the code is kind of broken in there. Um, so I'm basically just doing this video because I want the breadboard for something else. And I haven't had a chance to actually take this and put it on a proto yet. I don't know if I ever will. But the hardware is simple enough that if I ever had to do that, I would just rewatch this video and build it for my myself on a on a proto board but the code is bad i'll put it up on the website as is and uh i haven't looked at this in about two months so it's going to be a rough video as well because i'm trying to figure out what i was thinking that night when i put all this together so let's uh work through it uh easy vr is really nothing special there just software serial tx and rx um the EE squared over here, the 24LC256, again, nothing special there. I think the address is set to all zeros on that. Uh, you're using uh, analog pins 4 and 5 for the uh, clock and data lines. Rotary encoder, pretty basic there. We're using the two 10K dividers. Watch that video. It's a direct drop in here. We've got the 2.1 microfarad capacitors there to filter out some of that bouncing noise. Then we get into something interesting here, though. Um, so the, if you remember in the rotary encoder video, we actually had to use both interrupts to make it work because we wanted to catch it in both directions and not miss anything. Well, it turns out that when I'm using the infrared receiver here, I also need an interrupt. So I needed a way to select between looking at the rotary encoder and the infrared receiver it's because the Arduino only has two interrupts. Well, actually, at the time when I made this video, I thought the Arduino only had two interrupts, but somebody was telling me that there might be more. I'm not sure. So anyways, I had to figure out a way to to uh, select which interrupt or which device I wanted to look at and switch between them without, you know, using relays or anything like that. So over here, you'll see there's two little ICs and those are quad and chips and quad or chips. And, uh, and then there's a transistor there. And I'll get into that circuit on how I selected between looking at the infrared receiver and the rotary encoder here. Um, actually, let's just get into that right now. 
Okay. So, got the whiteboard out here. I'm going to go ahead and unplug that. All right. Making a mess here. So, basically, this circuit's not that cool. Hopefully, nothing falls here. We, um, we've got an OR. This OR goes to the interrupt. We'll just call that I. Outside of the, then the interrupt, or I'm sorry, the OR, we have two ANDs like that, another AND like that. These are two inputs here. On the one AND, we have the, we'll call this the, uh, the rotary encoder. So that's the rotary encoder output. Of course, there's two wires. The other interrupt, so this is interrupt zero, and then this is interrupt one. The other one, I'm using the other wire off of that but I don't need to show that for what I'm doing here. On the other end, though, we have the, uh, the PV, we'll just call it for now. It's the infrared receiver pin. And we're going to break into that here in a second as well. So then what I did was off of the Arduino here, I, select, I made a select pin output that goes to one of them. Then, jumping right off of that, we go into a 2N3904 NPN transistor, that's a 1K, pulled up with a 10K to 5 volts. Sorry, this drawing's awful. Then right off at this point right here, I brought it all the way over here. So basically what this is doing is inverting this signal. So, you know, when you make this, let's say this is high, that activates this transistor, puts it into saturation, and pulls this line low. So before when this was a zero or zero volts or off that Arduino pin, this was being pulled up to five volts. So this was at five volts here, which is a one. This, since this is zero, would have been a zero. And then that means that whatever I'm looking at here goes through. So like, let's say this was a one here the TV, you get a one here, and then you get a one here, okay? Zero here, zero, zero, so it just flows through. It doesn't care since it's sort of like a switch, so if this was a one, if the rotary encoder is turning, nothing happens. This stays at a zero the whole time. When this is a zero, this is a zero. So it disables the rotary encoder while it enables the receiver, okay? Hopefully that makes some sense. I know this this video is kind of going to be rough, so I apologize. Uh, if when you make this a one now, let's switch it. Make this a one. That makes this a one. Take the one through. It saturates the transistor and pulls this low to a zero. So that zero goes up to here, zero. So anything that's happening over here to the TV remote is ignored because this stays at a zero. It's an AN. This is at a one. So when this is a zero, this is a zero. When this is a one, this is a one. So it's transparent with the rotary encoder, which is then passed through the OR. So it's a selection between the two, and that's how I, that's what I use to select between the two. And yeah, this is probably the dumbest way of doing this, but when I was 10 beers in, and all I had was these logic gates, that's what I used. So that's that. Now. The other thing here is, is I use two infrared LEDs to output to the TV to drive the TV to turn things on and off. And the reason for that, well, it's, there's actually two reasons. One is it makes it more universal. So if I'm driving two infrared LEDs at different wavelengths, um, depending on what kind of receiver I'm uh, correlating that to, um, I should get something, right? The other reason is because I ordered two wavelengths uh, infrared LEDs and spark fun put them in the same bag without marking them so I didn't know which was which so I decided to control both and to do that because infrared LEDs need a little bit more current than your standard LED and you don't want to drive them right off your Arduino pin you could if you wanted to but I didn't want to blow out my pin so I did something like this and I think those are 50 ohms hold on I'll get this right here in a second no that's not right uh, okay, let me just draw this like this a little bit. And that's your 5 volt rail. These are each 100 ohms. 
So the total gives you 50 ohms, 100, 100, 100, 100. Then this goes down through the through the LED here, the two LEDs like that. Then the cathodes are tied together, and then those go through the uh, transistor here, and that's a 1K. And then that goes off to the pin Arduino pin. So when I drive this pin high with five volts, I saturate the transistor and I pull this low, and I complete the circuit. All right. That's how the infrared driver LEDs work. Now, just a little, a few notes about that infrared receiver. Uh, now, TV remotes basically work. You know, a lot of people are going to do this differently um, because these TV remotes they put out different codes, and each brand has their own codes. But it's all pretty much the same. So they have a little LED in here. Let's just draw this out so we can get an idea here. And this LED turns on and off very fast at like 32 kilohertz. So like if we're just going through time, this is going on and off, on and off at 32 kilohertz, on and off, on and off at 32 kilohertz, something like that. And I'm not even sure about the frequency, and we'll get into that a little later once we dig into the code. But basically what you get here is every time you're switching really fast like this, this would be equal to a 1, or this, and then this would be equal to 0, 1, 0, 1. That's one way of looking at it. The other way is to measure times here. Okay. So when we get into my code the way I did it, it'll make a little bit more sense. And I made it very easy so you don't have to memorize the codes because these codes can be really long and confusing. So I didn't really get into that. But um, basically with the, with the I... Uh, infrared receiver I have here it stays high at 5 volts and only goes low when it gets the uh, 32 kilohertz signal so if, if it receives this is what I'm outputting right now off of the infrared receiver and then in real life it could be it's getting hit with infrared like that so it demodulates this and just brings me low when it's receiving a bunch of crap like that Okay, so I don't actually have to do anything with it. It's pretty simple. So I know when this goes low, I'm getting stuff. And what I decided to do in my code is instead of trying to figure out what these codes mean, I just used my interrupt to measure the times. So I have something that's like, nah, not like that. But I have something coming off of that pin that looks like, you know, like this, like that. And then it's really thin pulses. You know, they're all over the place. So what I'm doing is I'm measuring these times. Off times, on times, off times, on times. I'm storing all of that in microseconds into the EEPROM. Then when I go to output this code, so I have all these times, and these are crazy long, you know, times in microseconds. Then what I do in the code is when I need to drive the pin high, I oscillate my infrared LEDs, turn them on and off, on and off for that on time. And then I turn them off. Then I oscillate them at 32 kilohertz or whatever the frequency is. We'll look at that here in a second. And I turn them off. So I have a I have a long list of times. And that's how that's how the whole thing works. And we're gonna go into that here in a second. But I guess if you feel like you could replicate what I've done here, then you could stop watching and you could stop the torture now because this video is going to be crazy long, crazy confusing because I did not document that code well at all. So let me think if there's anything else here hardware-wise we have to look at. I don't think so. So anyways, with that, let's go jump into the code and really have fun. All right, so here's the code. And if you're still watching this, I guess you're ready for some more pain. So, uh... Let's start right up here at the top. We include the EEPROM library, and this is used to store variables local to the uh, to the Arduino in the non-volatile memory. So when you cycle power to the Arduino, you can still access data. Uh, then we include the wire library. That's for the I squared C to the external EEPROM. Uh, then the software serial for the communication to the voice recognition module. And of course, the liquid crystal library for the LCD screen. Uh, then we go ahead and start up the 
communication to the voice recognition module. We're going to call it voice. Uh, our RX and TX is on uh, pins 15 and 16. I don't know which is which. We'll get back to that here in a second. Uh, liquid crystal setup and a whole crap ton of variables. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Then we attach our interrupts for the rotary encoder. Um, then we set up the I.O. here. So pin 11 is the IR encoder interrupt select. This is to select what, which, um, which device you're going to use the interrupt for because we do need that other interrupt for the, uh, for the infrared uh, receiver. Okay, anyway, then the encoder has two LEDs built into it. So we have a green LED and a red LED. It's actually just a bicolor LED. Uh, then we have a selection button. It's active low, meaning that when we push it, it goes low. Uh, okay, then we have 15 and 16. TX from voice, RX to voice. This is with respect to the... Um, to the voice recognition module so TX from voice means RX on the Arduino so you can go back up to this and figure out which is which so that would be RX on the Arduino and that would be TX on the Arduino I think I don't know but anyways pin 4 is then the pin we use to drive that transistor to drive those infrared LEDs with all the current then we go ahead and write digital pin uh, 11 low this was that um, interrupt select pin um, so here I define what it means low is the encoder high is if you're using the infrared receiver uh, then we set up the serial the hardware serial at 115 200 that's just for debugging and diagnostics uh, then we set up the voice recognition module at 9600 bits per second di squared C we start up then with the external EE prom uh, all right LCD setup, and then we go ahead and do a button count is equal to the EEPROM at address zero. So basically what this is, and I, I want to just explain this briefly here, we store the number of configured buttons locally on the Arduino. So on boot up, we know how many buttons we have read so far. Okay, this is important, and as we go along, this will make more sense. All right, then we go ahead and print uh, voice remote commands and, and we, we the number of commands. So we actually print that value out. A little bit of a delay. And then this is critical. I'm surprised I didn't put any comments here. Voice start subroutine. So now we got to go down to voice start and go through this torture. Uh, this is the boot up sequence I defined for the voice recognition module and I have to find it here now again I'm I'm looking at this code for the first time since a very long time ago alright voice start LCD clear then we do trans time then we do voice dot print Y to the voice recognition module I have no idea what that means so I have to pull up the easy VR user manual and go down and find where all these commands are ah, right here command Y set transmit delay I don't know exactly what that is right now off the top of my head but it's probably has something to do with the delay time between how how you're sending characters to the display or maybe it's the other way around but it's probably both ways actually so anyways we do a print of that then we delay it then we do a voice dot print of up letter um, position 10 in that array or in that string I use the word array and string pretty interchangeably probably very incorrect but anyways let's jump back up to this up letter 10 and see what that is so I'm gonna have to highlight that and then you can see up letter here is a string of letters A to Z now the reason I did that was is because the voice recognition module identifies letters as zeros or not as zeros but as numbers so if you send it an A that's the same thing as a zero and it just goes zero one two three four all the way up uh, this is in there somewhere I don't know exactly where it is but it expects letters or ASCII character letters as its numbers so I decided to come up with a string and then when I send it uh, a letter you know up letter of zero then it'll send out an A but I know I'm really sending it a zero you know so it kinda makes things easy 
So what I did here was send a 10, and who knows what letter that is, but that set the delay here for 10 milliseconds. Or 0 to 10 milliseconds. Okay. Then we jump out of that subroutine and we go to voice status. And this is the most critical subroutine, I think, in this whole thing. Let's get find out where that is. I have no idea what I labeled it. I don't know. I told I'm I should probably ah here it is voice status for some reason I called it voice wait over here. So what we do is detach the interrupts just because I don't want to jump out of this if I'm scrolling the the encoder for any reason. Uh LCD set cursor to that for some reason I don't know why. And then uh do a digital write of 13 so we're just uh, writing, I believe that's one of the LEDs. Now, status in zero, status in one. These, this is going to be the response from the voice recognition, and we're going to store it into these two variables here, into either one of these addresses of that uh, array. But well, this will make more sense here in a second. So whenever you send something to the voice recognition module, you're, you're going to expect either uh, one character or, or one or two characters, never more than that, I don't think. But anyways, what we do is we blow out what we received the last time, and then we jump into an infinite loop here, while one. I don't know, let's see where that ends at, down here. Yeah, so it's inside of this, the voice response variable is equal to voice.read, if that voice response is ever greater than zero, that means we got data, okay? And then if data count, so that's all part of this. Data count would also be zero. I'm trying to look at what it does if nothing's happening. It will basically just, uh, where am I at here? Digital read, oh, so you could you could push the button to escape out of this too. And that's what this little thing is. So if you're in that while loop stuck and you never receive data, you could blow yourself out of the out of the while loop and then reattach the interrupts. So anyways, we don't care about that. Let's just say we're in the loop and we're expecting data to come back. Alright, I didn't want to get too sidetracked here, but anyways. Voice response is greater than zero. All of a sudden, we got some data there. Voice status in of data count. So data count would be zero is equal to the voice response. So we got our first character. Timeout is equal to the current milliseconds. Then we increment data count and then wait a little bit. And whenever you receive a character from the voice recognition module, you have to respond with a space, an ASCII space, okay? That's one of those gotchas in the user manual that you might forget. So make sure that you respond with everything you get with a space. Okay. So now the data count is greater than zero. Then we have this other little condition where we, if the current millisecond minus the last millisecond we wrote is greater than 30, this is basically saying, hey, did we wait more than 30 seconds, 30 milliseconds after our last input from the voice recognition module. This is just basically a simple timeout because like I said, you could either be you could either get one character or two characters. So if we get two characters, um, then this if all right, let's just say we're within this, this doesn't happen. So our second character would then be we would come back up to the while loop. But now that data counts greater than zero, the millisecond, the timeout thing here is active, so we're waiting for that. But if we do get data, it's the same thing. Voice, res uh, voice response would be greater than zero, and we would get something. Data count would be incremented, so that would be the one status in of one now, and that would be our second character. And then the timeout in milliseconds uh, restarts. And then we know since it won't send more than one character, well, this could actually support more than one, but anyway, or more than two, sorry. So if the data count is now greater than zero, which it is, in milliseconds, this will time out. Then it's simply 4i is equal to zero. Oh, then it simply prints out those two characters or whatever the data count was. So like I said, this would support more than two characters. 
Then it sets the date account equal to zero, it reattaches the interrupts, uh, writes the LED low, and then breaks out of the while loop, and we're out. Okay. Now we can go back down here to wherever that was. Voice start. All right. So now I w I'm only going to go through that once because I call that a lot after everything I do. Now I didn't clear out status in of zero and one. So anything that that voice recognition sends to me, I can actually use now in my program. It's a global variable. So I can use it down here in this subroutine too if I wanted to, but I printed it off on the screen and if you look in the manual, when you send a Y, your expected reply is a status success. You have to go down here to status and see what that would be. Status success is an O and we do get a nice little O on the screen when, when that happens. Okay, so now I'm going to blast through these qu pretty quickly here. So that's what we do. We do a Y. Then we send over, clear the thing, and then we send over a V, which is the command level. That, I have no idea what that is either. I, it's been a while and I forget these things. A command V, I don't know what that is. Where is it? Command V, where are you? Um, if I don't find it here in a second, I'm bailing on this. Uh, command level. Oh, this is how strict it's going to be. So whether or not it thinks it's a success, whatever it hears. I decided to send it a 2 for whatever reason. i got to get into that. All right, language. We set the language. We set the timeout. I think I sent set it to 0. That must, I don't know what that means. Maybe infinite since I'm going into listen mode, not just listen forever. Maybe it's strict, I don't know, you'll have to check the manual. Then the command knob we set. Um, what the heck is the command knob? Because now I'm kind of curious here. Uh, set SI knob to specify level. So, oh, this is kind of more along the lines of uh, how strict it is. So typical, I don't know what I set it to. I think you can, I experimented with these values a lot too to find something that worked for me. Because sometimes it will hear a word that you know, while in the ambient, that is its trigger word, and it gets kind of annoying. All right, so we that's the boot up. Then what we do here is uh, you have to look back at my demonstration video, but I use the mute button a lot in the program, or in the in the program basically. So I don't always have to read something from external memory. So basically, what we do here is we load in the timing data for the mute button so that I have it here in local f memory and I can access that memory a lot faster than I can access the external memory so I just load it in locally here so I can use it because I use it so much okay so we'll get into more about that but you know it's it's basically we have a whole addressing system here and we have high bytes for the address we have low bytes because remember in the external EEPROM everything is bytes and you're gonna have numbers larger than 255 so you have to break things up into high and low bytes and then recombine them and that's exactly what happens here so we we begin a transmission with the EEPROM and I have videos on how to work with this uh, we write to the address first high low byte and the transmis transmission then we do a request and it looks like I only request one byte while one I think I do a little bit more here while one if wired out available break data low is equal to wired out read okay I'm not sure exactly what I'm doing here, but I'll have to come back to it. I just want to get out of this. So we read in the mute button, and then we also use the enter button a lot because, you know, F, what we do is we mute the TV when we hear the trigger word, then we listen for the channel, and then once we get the channel information, we read the channel information, timing information out of external memory, and then we press the enter button. So it's a very fast transition so we don't have to load in three buttons worth of uh, of timing data so we also load in the enter button which is stored in memory here looks like everything is plus 200 here and I'm gonna I'll get back to all this later in a little bit 
So we read in the enter button and the mute button. So now we have that in local memory. Let's get back up to the code here because I don't want to spend too much time on, on how I did data scheming. All right. So now we're into, we went to, we're right here. We did the voice start. Now we're in the loop, all right? And most of this is how the menu system works. So pulses is equal to the rotary encoder data. And we play around with that a little bit. So if pulses are greater than zero and menu is equal to zero, oh, this is just a out of range thing. So if you're ever greater than 30, you know, just slam it at 30 and keep it at 30. Or if you're ever greater than 60, slam it at 60 when you're in the menu one. And of course, if, if pulses are ever less than zero, slam it to zero. You know, you don't want negative pulses for the menu system. And look, it's pretty simple how you work with the menu. So if pulses are greater than 10 and less than 20, and menu is equal to zero, keep, you know, display program mode, and then listen for the button. If the button clicks in while you're in that, then you set the menu for one and then you jump out so that's another condition so these are all menu zero items which are um, program mode listen mode and reboot reboot just sends you back to voice start okay just in case anything gets goofy on there so then if you jump into menu one like I showed you then here's all the menu one options you can name a new TV and this just names the trigger word that it listens for uh, that's kind of a long one uh, then we have the train mute button. I think I even, yeah, and then we also train the enter button here. Um, and then we have a new button, brand new control button. And I think that's pretty much it as far as the menu goes. Or you could just reset everything. So let's work through some of these. And then, of course, a back button, which just blows the menu back to zero. So that's how the whole menu system works. Pretty basic. All right, so let's go up and see how a a button is trained. Actually, we're going to start right here and name a new TV. So if you push the button in, this is how you're going to train the new TV. All right, we clear the menu. We do a U, which I have no idea what that is. We'll have to find it here. We're going to have to see what a command U is. What is that? U. Remove SD command. And I believe what I'm going to do is do a U, and then I'm going to do a 0, since it's a trigger, and I'm going to do position 0. So it'll, it'll be U, 0, 0, but up letter of 0, 0, because that would be the same thing as going U, and then A, A. And then we jump to voice status. Okay, then it's going to insert G. Now G is just going to be, let's see what that is real quick here. G, insert new SD. So G, 0, 0 again. So that puts the new command in. And that's what it is. Then we go into the training of that. So now it's all ready to go. It's got a new thing in. Ah. So then we do, ah, I'm all over the place here. So then we do a T, which is train new command. And then, of course, it's going to be 0, 0. And then now it's listening. So it'll go into voice status here. Right, that menu I just or that subroutine I just went through. It's gonna go there and it's gonna hang out there for a while until it hears something and it'll either pass or fail. So right here, like I said before, we can use those variables down here outside of that uh, subroutine. And look, if status in is equal equal to zero, then continue on. But if we go down and see where this ends at, if I can find it. Oh man, why did I do that? This code's so brutal. Oh, right here. Else, do clear it and then print LCD dot print fail. So it failed. So if it doesn't equal a zero, which is a, or an O, and that which is a success, then fail and then slam the menu back to one, which will bring you out of this whole thing. So let's go back up now. All right, so we are right here. I'm just gonna put markers in here. Train second. So you do the same thing, and you can keep training it. And the more you train a word, the better it is, you know. So you, every time you say a word, you say it a slightly different way, so it, it gets uh, better at learning your voice. Same thing, train second, T, zero, zero. 
All right, so then we train a second, then we train it a third time, and I think I even, yep, even train it a fourth time. So go through all of those, train mute button, same thing, but now, see, the enter button, or sorry, the name new TV was the trigger word, which is like when it's just sitting there doing nothing and you, it's waiting to hear that trigger word. When it does hear that trigger word, then it will mute the TV and do other things. So these... Let's go into the train mute button because this is an actual button. This will be kind of cool to go through here real quick. All right, so now we're in the train mute button. Let's see if I can get into where this goes. So button program zero. Is that right? Yeah, so if you push the button while you're in the train mute button, it's oh it fixes the pulses just so that oh it, it what what it does here is as soon as it reads the mute button it advances the pulses so that you can quickly then train the enter button so it advances you to the next menu that's kind of cool uh, fail is set to one for some reason so while fail is equal to one oh I think this is the whole f the whole fail system so if something goes wrong you can set fail to equal to zero. I don't know why I have it like this, but anyways, like I said, man, I was pretty heavily, anyway, <laughs> button program zero. So this is how you work it out. Uh, obviously, the mute button would be the first button that you send down to that subroutine. This is the whole learning, and I just want to show you here that the train enter button is the exact same thing, except train button one. Then when you train a random button, look what happens you send over the button count so which is incrementing every time you make a new button and we're gonna get into this root subroutine your button program here in a second but I just want to show you how it works and look we even write that to the EE prom the internal EE prom after we increment it so that we know where we're at and next time we program a button the next time we're up and running we know we where we are because we'll read this out of internal memory all right, so let's jump down to button count, and we'll spend a little bit of time down. Probably not a little bit, probably a lot of time. Because this is how you memorize buttons. Uh, triggered with second command sec. I don't know what that is. Uh, oh, man, we've got a lot going on in here. Okay. Button program. Here we are. So here we are, void button program, and then integer button so that's that variable the button count we're getting okay so we get that into the program down here let's move through it all right LCD clear it goes ahead and, and does a U so it's it's getting it set up for a new word so first thing it's gonna do is train the voice recognition for the word that you want to use to command the button so if it was the channel 5 that you wanted the TV to go to or your your TV remote button 5 you would say 5 so let's just say so what it's doing is you doing a U but this time instead of 0 it's doing a a 1 here because it's gonna be in a different group here so U remove and instead of using uh, zero as the trigger, now we're in the generic buttons or the generic uh, voice commands. So it's going to grab that, and then the position within that, which could be 31 or 32 positions, zero to 31, we use the button, which was the variable we brought down into this subroutine right up here. See, integer button. So we bring that down. We're in that position, and we go down to voice status, and we hope we get an O but we're not checking that in here then we insert G same thing one button and then we go through the training procedure one two three four and here look oh right here fail so I don't know why oh you know why fail is equal to one here why we keep setting it this is important I want to show you this so if in case we do get a failure what's kind of cool here is instead of having, and this is more just for me to write the code in a, a way to, that's quick to, to, to test. Instead of, if we fail, instead of having to go through the whole menu again, what this would do is automatically send you back to the beginning. So fail is equal to one. And this will jump you out of the whole code, bring you back up, 
to wherever that is. I'm just looking. I don't want to get too sidetracked here. But if you go back up to the code here somewhere, wherever the heck it is, um, I'm looking for where one of the button counts is. I can't find it because there is a lot going on in this code here. Uh, I don't know where it is. Okay, new button. LCD print. Um, yeah, you would click this. Hmm. Okay. Ah, fail one. While wow, fail one. So that that basically this is what I wanted to show you, is that if the fail is one, it jumps you out, but it brings you right back to the very beginning of that, so that you can come back to that and retrain the, the four times. You don't have to go through the whole process over and over again. So anyway, that might have been a waste of time to get into right now. So anyways, we train it the four times and it goes through all of this. Okay, then what it does is it asks you to press the remote button right here. Okay, now this is the important part. This is where we learn the code, the timing sequence in for the code. All right, so what we do first is detach the interrupts, both of them. Then we write digital write pin 11 high. I believe this is the encoder select pin. So now we're going to listen to the infrared receiver. So the rotary encoder does nothing right now. All right, then I believe we light up an LED here. I think that's what that does. Then an attach interrupt to zero. Um, TV signal fall, that's where we'll go on that interrupt. That's the subroutine. And when it's falling, because you know when we receive infrared light on that receiver, it goes low. And we're gonna be going low and high very quickly. And we're measuring that time in between there. And that'll be, we'll get into that here in a second. All right, we set count equal to zero, and then we jump into this while loop here. And let's just say counts equal to not, or counts equal to zero still. So nothing happened yet. Let's see where the end of that while loop is down here. And basically what's happening here, okay, we're in between. This was the count. This is count is greater than zero. This is the while one. So what we're doing here is just flashing that LED on and off, okay? Now, we need to get into where this subroutine is, okay? Because now we're sitting there, and LED's flashing. We're waiting for that infrared receiver line to fall. So we go up here. We got to find that. TV signal fall right here. First thing we do is detach the interrupt. We have a variable here called stop. Micros minus start. All right, and start right now is just equal to zero. So whatever the elapsed, um, so micros is just the current time right now. Okay, I, I think so. We'll, we'll get into that here in a second. It doesn't matter yet. Okay, then the power of count is equal to stop. <laughs> okay, so this is getting a little crazy here. We need to go and see what power of count is equal to and what we're doing with it. Let me just jump up here. So power is just power is just a word. So a two byte word. Okay. So this is how we store all of those times. So stop is equal to micros minus start. So we've got a difference in time there. Right now, starts equal to zero. So it's just whatever the the current the current microseconds is the elapsed microseconds time. Okay, so we store that in as the first count. So zero count is incremented. Then start now is equal to the current microseconds. So the signal just fell. Now we reattach it. But this time it's going to be on rising. So right now we're low. Okay. Then we attach the interrupt to TV signal rise. Okay. As soon as the signal rises, then we detach the interrupt right here. Now we're in this subroutine. 
stop is equal to micros minus start. But this time, start was that low time here. Okay, so that was the time. This is actually the time micros minus start that we were low for. And that's exactly what this time is. So whatever the lowest, the low time was for is stored in stop. Power of count is equal to stop. So we store that and count now is equal to one. Who cares what it started out as? This could have been a really long time, but who cares? It was disregarded and we don't use it. But as soon as that signal rises, now we know how long it was low for. Okay, and we have that time here now. Count is incremented. Start now is reset to the current microseconds. And we reattach the internet up now for falling. Now look, this goes back and forth. Because now we have a start time for this. As soon as that signal falls again, m the current micros minus the start that was down here, this stop time right here, whatever value is stored in there, is the time that the signal was high for. So now we have all of these times, we and they're all stored in here. So you don't know which is which, really, but you know that power of count of zero means nothing, really. It was the current microseconds. Power count of one, however, is the low time. You know, because we started that while we were low, and we didn't store it until we rose. So we have the low time. So that would be the time, power of count of one would be with the time where we're oscillating that pin at 32 kilohertz. Okay, so this continues on, goes on, blah, 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 blah. Very, very, very fast. These are interrupts we're talking about here. So let's go back down to the button program code where that all takes place. All right, right here. If count is greater than zero, Digital right low. Uh, these are just LEDs. This LED right here, I believe, is the green because it goes immediately to green. And then we have a delay here of 2,000. And why would I have such a long delay? That's because I don't know how long this is going to take for it to oscillate and get all of its code in or all those times in. And I know they're interrupts, so while I'm delaying here, it's, it's going to os you know, it's going to be. By that time, the code will be received, trust me. And it doesn't really matter if you don't press the button right away because you won't increment a count until it receives infrared light. But as soon as it does, it jumps into this code. This pr time could probably be way smaller. But like I said in other videos, you know, always keep your times long until you get the code figured out and all the bugs worked out. Okay, so the code's stored in now. All right, this time's done. We've got the green LED on. We're going to detach the interrupt that was stored on that pin, you know, the infrared receiver, because we're done. We got it in. Ah, and then now we have to store it into external EEPROM memory. And then that's what all of this does, which is painful code, okay, for K. And there every... Every time sequence for every button is stored in 100 bytes. I just thought that'd be a good number to use, 100 bytes. Okay, so actually I don't know if it's 100 bytes actually. I think it's more like 200 bytes because, yeah, I think it's 200 because you have a byte, you have two bytes for every time because those times are longer than 255. They're bigger numbers than 255, so you need to use two bytes to, to store them. So look, what we have here, though, is data low. Low byte here is power of K, and K is zero. So remember power up there? I don't know why I call these power, but that's just what it is. Data low is equal to low byte. Data high is the high byte of that. So let's just work through one, zero address high is the high byte 200 times button plus j what the heck so j here is equal to zero um 200 times the button so what we're doing here though is because the button remember the but we've already have a mute we have a mute button programmed in zero we have a enter button programmed in one um for mute this is equal to zero, so it would just be equal to J. So it would be the first address. So that, that's what I'm showing you here is that that's zero. 
address low is also equal to, to zero in this case, okay? I'm just trying to, and it's high byte, low byte of that number, okay? So the mute button is zero, the enter button is one, and since each of them requires uh, 200 bytes, we have a 200 byte multiplier on that. So right now, if we had a random button, it like, you know, we're on our 15th button, this would be a 15 times that, times that. And I think the J will come into play here in a second. I don't know why I have that. So anyways, oh, the J is simply the position in address as we increment through the power variable here because we'll I think we send each byte here separately. So anyway, I hopefully that explains it. Where dot begin transmission, we write to the address high, low, and then we write the data low. Hmm, I don't know why I only send the low part of the data there. And then wire dot end transmission. We wait here a second. Oh, I know why. It's because we're sending first the low byte. And then we do that whole thing again here. Address high, address low. But look, J is incremented by one. So the next byte, the high byte of that data, is now incremented by one. And then I bet you any money, we send, yep, we send the high byte of that data. Okay? And it goes through that, I don't know, a hundred times. So it sends the low part of the variable, then the high part of the variable. And this is just to send all of that timing data into external memory. Wow, it's a lot of information. Okay, start is equal to zero. This was, remember, the start variable. So yeah, we do just set it to zero. That was to increment, to figure out the difference in time. Yeah, we, I think we set the LED to something else. Then break, get us out of this. Get us out of that. We're out of the while loop. Now we can reattach the interrupts and we set the encoder or the interrupt select pin low. So now we're looking at the rotary encoder again. <sighs> okay. Then what it does... Alright, so now we have the timing data programmed into the external EEPROM. Now it's going to ask you, do you want to test the button? And of course, I think your only choice is yes. <laughs> so, you, it goes into this infinite loop here, and as soon as you press the button, it is now listening. Or not listening, it's going to transmit the button's data. So this is a good exercise right here. So what we've done here is store all that timing data into memory. Now we're going to pull it out and use it. All right, same kind of thing here now. Even is equal to zero. I don't know why that is. And M is equal to zero. We'll see what these do here in a second, but I'm not sure. But again, it's K equals zero, less than 100, blah, blah, blah. Address high, address low. Remember, button. Now we're on, we could be on any button. Zero and one were reserved for the mutant train. M. So M is serving the same purpose as J in this case. Plus the 200 byte multiplier. High byte, low byte. Where did I begin transmission? Add our address high, add our address low. End transmission. Now we're going to request from one byte from there. While one, if wired out available, break. Data low is equal to the wire read. So we're reading it out the same way we put it in. Delay, one, now we do an M++. So now we're one address higher than that, which should be the data high of that. Okay, wire.begin transmission, same thing. Address high, address low, wire.end transmission. Wire.request from one, if it's available, break out and read it in as data high. Now, remote K. Remember, this is only one single time. That could, that's just the low time that that pin is low for. We need to do, we need to, we, we've got a hundred separate times in there. So what we do here is word data high low, and this will combine the two bytes into a word. A word is two bytes because, you know, uh, those times are longer than 255, so we had to break it into two bytes. 
Remote K is just a giant array of numbers. I think this, so it should be re remote K and there's probably way up there at the top. Let me just show you where that I set that up. Remote of 100, power was of 100 as well. Okay, now let's go back down here. We're right here. So we do this now, remote K of, of word, data high, data low, and then we increment M again. And then we jump back up. Now we're back here. And now we're at the second time, which would be the high time. Remember, we have low time, high time, low time, high time, low time. And it goes back and forth, back and forth. And we know when we transmit, we're going to have to oscillate the pin at 32 kilohertz when it's high. Okay, and we go through that. We store up. We go through that 100 times, so we get about 200 bytes pulled out, combined into 100 words. Oof. So now we have everything in remote K. Now we're ready to transmit. Okay. And now it looks like this even variable here has something to do with it. Because, right, remember I said every other is when we're going to oscillate. So what we do here... We have 100 words in there in remote K. So we jump into this for loop. If even is equal, equal to zero, digital write for low. Four is the infrared LED um, pin. Delay microseconds of remote I. So whatever was stored in I, just delay. Okay. Then even is equal to 1. Okay. And then we'll jump back here. We go back here. Now even is equal to 1. What we do here is... Uh, actually, I was just kind of thinking. I'm not sure if I had that timing right. Low, high. Uh, we'll have to figure that out. That's something to experiment with. Your timing as to what you actually have. I think I did something in there where I bumped the data up by 1 or... Just to just so I'm oscillating at the right time. But anyways, so we don't do anything when it's when the even variable is equal to zero. Then what we do here, uh, now the next time around we set it to one. The next time around even is now equal to one. So that we'll, we won't go through this. We'll go to if even is equal to one, I are on subroutine of remote I. Ah, so now we have to go find this subroutine infrared on. I uh, don't know where that is. I have no idea where that is. We've got a lot of voice stuff. Um, and I'm going to have to dig this out. I should edit this all out, but I probably won't. <laughs> okay. Uh, no. That's the voice wait. Um... What's all this stuff? Oh, that's all the encoder. This is the entire encoder interrupt handling. Uh, I don't know. Wait, a rise. Oh, we're still in it. Okay. I think I'm close. Um, okay. It's still not there. Okay, there's a lot there's a lot of voice recognition in here. Oh, there's also a listening mode we gotta get into now as well. But I'm just looking for I think I missed it. Darn it. Alright, let me do a quick find here because I don't know where that is and I didn't mark any of these. Was it called infrared on? Yeah. Let's see where that subroutine is. There it is. Ah, okay. That was a waste of time. All right, I'm going to even put something in here. So I find this next time. I R on. I take it if you're watching this video, what is it? Almost an hour long. That you don't care if I'm waiting for me to figure something out for a second. All right, void, I R on. Look, we have that long variable. That word has come over with us. We're calling it on time. Long. Os time start <clears throat> is called is equal to micros the current microseconds 
I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm going to try to figure this out as I go. While microseconds is less than the os time start, minus that is less than on time. So what this is setting up is a little while loop. We're going to do something while this time that we're bringing over is, um, well, what we're doing here is just setting a little time out here. So we're grabbing the current microsecond minus the os time uh, here. I'm trying to figure out what we're doing here. Oh, okay. This is just to give us a starting place. So this will continually move uh, forward. This was the current time. So do this while this is less than the on time we brought over, right? So we're gonna have this while loop activated for this on time perfectly, okay? And what we're doing here, let's see what it is. Digital write for high, the, the infrared LEDs. Wait 13 microseconds. And then digital write low for 13 microseconds. And just keep doing that. Um, just going to grab a calculator here and figure out what frequency that is. So the total period of that is 13 plus 13 microseconds. Um, so that's 26 E negative 6. And then 1 divided by that puppy gives me 38 0.46 kilohertz. So I was off. It's not even 32 kilohertz. It's 38 kilohertz is what I oscillate this at. So that happens. So that continues on until this this is suddenly greater than my on time, then break out of it. And then that's it. Okay. Let's go down here. I'm going to stop this code here in here in a second. Okay. Where is the whole training thing again? I keep losing my spot here. I'm just looking for the, ah, right here. So we transmit, uh, where is it? Oh, okay, right here. So, so we go through this whole thing here a hundred times. So we go through a hundred of those words and we keep going up there every other one to oscillate the pin at 38 kilohertz. Then we set that pin low just in case it stops on a high side. Okay. All right. Then we're done there. And then we go over down here. So as soon as it transmits, it goes into a second menu and prints good. And you can rotate it a little bit or no. So you can set the fail. If it's good, set the fail to zero. It did not fail. And it breaks out of it. If it did fails one and it breaks out and it re goes through the entire thing again okay pretty straightforward now that fail here is what I was explaining before fail zero that's the condition to enter into this uh, con mode here which wherever the heck that was where is it I don't know uh, it's something in here it's hard to follow this code. Like I said in, in my demo video, that I wanted to clean this up, but never had the time to. Okay. Well, anyway, I just want to show you where it jumps out of that code here. Train third, fourth. Um, and then when it goes down to, well, I don't know where it is. That's the train mute, train enter, new button. But ah, right here, this is where it is. Ah, oh, man. While fail is equal to zero. So we just set, why do I keep doing that? So while fail is equal to equal to one. So if suddenly fail is equal to zero and it jumps out. Now we're done. We, we shift the pulses, we uh, change the menu, and we um, increment the button count and store that in there. All right. I'm done with that part. Now what I want to go into is how this thing is actually listening to words. So let's just go. One of the menu items in there was uh, listen mode. And I just want to go into that really quick here. Listening mode is right here. So when you're in listening mode, it just sits there and it says listening. And what we got here 
is we do an else a voice dot print of O to it, which I guess is the timeout. I think that's what that was, wasn't it? Command O. Set recognition timeout. We set it to I think zero. Yeah, we set it to zero. Go to the voice status. Hopefully everything's good. Then we print a D. I don't know what that is. We print a D. Why do we print a D? What does that do? D, D, D. Where are you? D. Activate SD recognition. Okay, so we activate D, and then we send over a... Oh, I actually didn't. I see. Here's a good example. I didn't use the up letter. So I sent over an A. I could have used up letter of zero, but this is to set the recognition for the trigger word. Okay, then we go to voice status. Now what we do here is to make sure everything's good. If status is equal to R, status is zero. So we actually got two characters back, R and, uh, and then in status one, A. So what does that mean? I don't know. But... Um, Activate that in status will be the actually I think did I do this right? Where am I at here? Oh D A voice status R A. So you actually have to go in and see what R and A mean here. I th I don't I think it's more not status uh letters here meaning something like some kind of word. I think it actually is telling me which TV. Oh okay here recognized com oh no that's not right command position recognize sd command okay so we're good all right never mind result is good okay triggered with tv oh okay actually what happens here let me just make sure i got this thing here if mute here so we're stuck here in this menu this is basically just a while loop it appears it's kind of surprised I had that there. So we're sitting here, and as soon as we go into this DA, this is listen mode, and what what happens is, and then it gets stuck here, there, you know, and it waits, and it keeps going back and waits for for the word. As soon as it hears the word, then we get this R. We've recognized A, which is the first trigger word. Then what we do is go mute. I'm not going to go back through all that, but what mute will do is transmit the mute button. Then, okay. We already have that pulled out of memory, so it'll just go into that and mute the TV. Uh, the LED will go high, then it'll say triggered, and then it sets the timeout now, but instead of infinite timeout, we, we uh, control it and we set it to two. And this is just so that there, we might want to say a, sec second, um, a second letter, not a letter, a, a second channel, like five, five. We don't want to say five and then have an infinite timeout for the second one. We want to quickly just say five. And if you don't say anything, you just get a timeout. So it goes into the voice status here and it waits. Um, Voice.print D B here. So now we're, 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 what we're doing here is going now. Uh, oh, sorry. This isn't the second channel. I gotta, I'm figuring this out as I go here. What this is, this is first the trigger word. So this is like if you said TV, and then it says triggered, it heard the TV. And then you set the timeout for a short time, and then you do DB here. And I'm not going to pull up the manual, but basically that's saying go to the generic group and listen to those words now. You know, the 32 generic words. And then it's, it's now it's listening for a short time for a channel, so or, or a, a button command. And then if you said five, then we get a first button. Okay. So if status zero there is equal to one. So what it's telling me here is I get the R saying we're good. And then we flash the LED here. And then for this part here, um, J up letter J. Okay. What, what this is doing is scanning through my up letters here, A to Z 
to see which one equals which. So this second one, the first one is a success. The second status one character that comes back from the recognition module is going to be which button. And remember, it's, it's going to come back as a letter, A to Z, which is a representation of the commands or of the, uh, the buttons here. So what I do here is as soon as I hit one of these up letters, I quit. Uh, and then I know it quit on the J that of that was equal to that status. So you're going to notice here in a second that I do use J in my, in my uh, calculations here of where that is in, in memory here. So J is just going to be equal to a number from 0 to 31. And I know to use it. M again is the multiplier. So J is like the button here, whichever button it is. And then of course there's the 200. And J could be equal to zero or one. Okay, like if I said mute. All right, address low, high, high low. I'm not gonna go back through all this, but it basically does the whole thing again for K. And so it pulls it all out of memory, stores it into remote K, okay. Oh, and then it says lcd.print second button. So this is like we said, we said the TV's name. Then we said the channel five. And now we could say five again here. Uh, and, and then it does a print here. So it's saying, hey, listen to the uh, generic buttons here and listen for a little bit. Uh, and if it does get something in, the second button has been triggered and then do the same exact thing here and check to see what J, what uh, button it is. And then of course down here, use that J to pull it out of memory, it pulls it out of memory. Okay, and now you have both of your buttons or just one. If you get a timeout in the second one, it won't use it because the, the button, if you notice here, I have this little thing in here. If it does get something, second button's equal to one. Uh, otherwise, this would never occur. We would just get a timeout, and it would just continue on. All right. So we have those. First button. If first button is equal to, equal to one, so we do set that. If something was garbled up, or if you said the TV's name, and then it didn't understand what button you said, you wouldn't even go into this. All right. Even equal to zero. All right. Then we go through the whole transmit procedure. Routine, sorry, whatever you want to call it. And it does that. I are on. Again, I was kind of surprised, though, that... That it... Anyway, whatever. It works, and it works well. Oh, I think I know why, guys. Why I'm doing things opposite of the way you would think. But anyway, I could get lost in the thinking about this forever. If it doesn't work, you could simply just toggle one, the even number so you're oscillating on the other end of it instead of the first end. Again, I'm kind of thinking about this as I'm going along. So anyways, it, pr it transmits that button. All right. Then what do we do next here? I'm kind of lost here again. Delay. Digital right four low. Okay, first button's back to zero. Now if we had a second button, we put a little delay in there too between between the second button here. Hopefully I can record more than an hour on this screen recorder. If we get a second button, we transmit the second button. All right, and we already pulled it out of memory. All right, power I. We call this power I. So we reused the variable we used before. So we had to, I actually had to reuse variables because uh, I was actually getting crashes in the Arduino. If I was because you can't have too many variables going. Let me just show you what I mean. See all these variables I have for 100 power of 100 remote of 100 mute remote of 100 enter remote. These are this is where I store the mute button and the enter button locally. So I only have these two variables to play with. And since I have two buttons, I have to reuse these a lot throughout the program. If you add just one more, look here, I have it even commented out. When I had this one in here for the second button, the Arduino would crash, actually. I didn't even know that was possible. Ah, and now I lost my spot. Can you believe that? Where was I? I have no idea. Oh, no. Oh, we were, we were in listen mode, so that shouldn't be too hard to find here.
go back quickly to listen mode. Where are you? Okay, here we go. All right, so we transmit the first button. Uh, if the second button's good, we do we transmit that again. And I was just noting that we have the uh, power, the difference in variables there. Okay, and then we set the infrared pins low, just so you know they're not sitting there wasting and wasting energy and causing a disruption. Uh, okay. Anyways, then what we do is set the LEDs low. Ah, and then we execute the enter button. So that's its own subroutine. It already has the enter button pulled out of memory, so it has all of those times laid out. And then it, and then it delays 250 milliseconds. And then it unmutes the TV. So it hits the mute button again. And then we're done. So then it jumps back out and it just keeps listening and listening and listening. And I can't, don't think I can go through another line in this code. So that's an hour, long, over an hour long video. Hopefully that helps you. Gets a complete walkthrough. All of this code will be on my website. So uh, link should be in the description. And please don't ask me any questions on this code because... I just figured it out as I went along here. It's amazing what, what you'll do uh, in a single night with uh, a case of beer. Thanks for watching.